The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hey, Jay. Thank you for joining me. How's your morning over in California going? It's it's going good. It's been raining the last week and a half, so it's like a sad depression on California when we're locked in. But now it's supposed to be clearing up. So yeah, but I kind of like if we're supposed to be shut in. I like that it's raining rather than being because I I really want to be outside when it's sunny. You know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I just would like my kids to be able to go in our backyard. That would be my <laughs> to get out work. of the house get while out. I'm doing work. In the yeah, like right, right before we started this, we we recently moved into a new place and they're all like running upstairs. So they have these stairs, which just kids under 10, they're like, you, we have stairs. Why? Let's run up these constantly. Yeah. Um, but really loud. So I'm like, do not run up the stairs for the next <laughs> hour. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we've already got a lot of folks joining us in the webinar. We were just overwhelmed and amazed at how many people signed up for this. We're so excited to be able to resource the church in this way during COVID-19. So um, as we're waiting for folks to join us, I actually want to put a poll up. Um, let's see. Jay has a question that he wanted to ask you all. So I'm going to launch it now. We'd love for you to, to answer us. Um, are you doing online small groups? That is the question that we would love to hear from you. Oh man, this is awesome. We can see them coming in as they're answering. So far, it looks like it's about 75% yes, 25% oh, no. Wow. Yeah. So Jay, I was, I was really, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah. I was just kind of curious because I know I know a lot of people have embraced Facebook Live and YouTube Live, but I'm curious who have actually leaned into groups. So that's kind of cool to kind of see people, so many people have embraced it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I wanted you to talk a little bit as we're waiting for everybody to join on. So originally I was going to ask the question, are you doing church online? And you said, actually, I think we should ask more about online small groups. So tell us a little bit about why you wanted to ask this question versus the online church question. Yeah, I, I think the idea is that, you know, um, well, the, the funny thing is, I think a lot, it's really easy for people and just generally church leaders to embrace teaching methods online, because that's been around forever. You know, if, if you kind of go back to, you know, Paul wrote letters from a distance, uh, the church was early adopters to radio ministry, to TV ministry, to even, you know, internet type of online teaching. I think the question is, how do we do like fellowship online is is a more robust thing because there's this shallow part of social media and the internet and then there's you know biblical community which is you know supposed to be this very deep thing and i think we get a little skittish as as the church of like can we do that online and so i was really i i wasn't i'm not really worried about churches getting their church service online i think that's pretty simple and for a lot of people seamless um but doing like all the other stuff your church is supposed to be doing and the church is called to do like groups. I was kind of curious how many would push back because I've had, I've heard some say like, we're not going to do any of this and, and others even choosing to still meet um, mm -hmm. um, in some large gatherings because they, you know, they don't want to, they don't believe certain people should tell them what to do, but I was just kind of, I was interested on it. So I'm encouraged by the response so far. Yeah, me too. So it looks like we're at about 72% yes, 28% no. Um, looks like 88% of people have voted. So if you're just joining us, there's a poll. We'd love to hear, are you doing online small groups? Jay, this is one of the things I think that you do an amazing job of at Saddleback, uh, of putting people into online groups. And I can't wait for us to dive in and talk about that today, as this is a fairly new idea for many folks in the church. And um uh, you know, as as um, devastating as COVID-19 is, we are seeing it really push church leaders and ministry leaders to be innovative and try things that they've never tried before. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted you to be our first interview on our mm. Vanderbilt Women Network live webinar series is because you're really a pioneer in this. So I'm excited to learn from you today. Well, thank you so much, folks, for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started at 11.03. I'm going to go ahead and close our poll. Thank you so much to everyone who um, participated in the poll. It looks like about 72% of us are doing online small groups in some way. 
28% of us um, are saying that we have not tried online small groups yet. So, um, oh, look, I can share the results. Let's see what, what that. Wow. Yes, drum roll, please. <laughs> but in the meantime, um, there you go. There's the results. Um, in the meantime, would love to hear from you. I'm already getting lots of folks typing in the question box where you're joining us from today. This is one of my favorite parts about doing webinars is just seeing people literally from all over the world. We've got Ken who's joining us from Scotland, which is amazing. Um, let's see. We've got Lynn from Charlotte, North Carolina. Hi, Lynn. Uh, we've got Pennsylvania. We've got North Carolina. Let's see. Um, we've got Glenn from Pennsylvania, a couple of Pennsylvania folks, Ohio, mm -hmm. Virginia, um, Georgia. This is so fun. There's so many responses here. New York City, Florida, Missouri, California. <laughs> California. Literally Let's do it. all over. Yeah, there you go. You're representing Dave. All right. Um, so as you are listening today, we would love for you to put your questions or comments. There's two ways you can do that. One is in the question box or in the chat box. Um, would love, we're going to open up, leave plenty of time for questions with Jay. I have um, heard Jay give his online to offline talk many, many times. And um, there's always questions at the end because it's just a phenomenal story of his own story, being a pioneer in church online. So. Um, Wanted to do a quick introduction, Jay, in case folks don't know who we are. I'm Holly Tate. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Vanderblumen, where we help churches and ministries, any Christian organization all over the globe with hiring and succession planning. And during this time of COVID-19, the Lord has blessed us with a global reach. And so we are trying to steward that network and bringing you resources in real time throughout this crisis with folks like Jay, who have the expertise to be able to help us all over the world with things that maybe we as church leaders or ministry leaders have never tried before. And so I'm excited to introduce you to my friend, Jay Cranda, who is the online campus pastor at Saddleback Church in Orange County, California. And Jay and I have uh, gotten to be travel buddies, teaching social media workshops all over the world which has been a phenomenal experience. And then we've also partnered through our work um, here at Vanderblumen with the State of the Online Church ebook that we published about a year ago. And it has been really interesting. About a year ago, we got some pushback from folks that said, there can never be church online, you know? And uh, here we are literally a year later where that resource has been a huge help for folks who are thinking differently about the church. Um, so tweet at Jay, follow him on Instagram, see cute pictures of his three kiddos <laughs> um, there at Jay Cranda. So Jay, I just want to start out our time together today um, with your story. I would love to hear how did the Lord bring you to where you are today, leading the online campus at Saddleback? And then as a part of that, would love to hear how your passion for church online came to be. Yeah, well, first off, thanks for having me on and thank you for everybody joining in right now. I love seeing the uh, the numbers. I, I always love seeing how we can connect on technology like this. I know it's something that when I started in ministry, I wanted to be a youth pastor that, you know, God really kind of grabbed a hold of my heart when I was in uh, high school and never wanted to be an online pastor. I don't even, that was not a thing when I was in high school or college, but as we were you know, as I was kind of growing up, really the internet was kind of maturing and there was another phase of, of the internet. Um, it's now been called, it's called the web 2.0 where you have websites like MySpace and Facebook kind of came about and people started to go, oh, wow, like websites aren't just these static little things, like they're actually interactive. And it was around that time that it was at the end of college, I was offered an opportunity um, at the end of my uh, my time at Biola here in Southern California that uh, to serve on a communications team at Saddleback. And I was interning at the time there, my senior year of, of kind of, of my time at Biola. And they had this communications role and I didn't know anything about communications. I read a bunch of books before I took the role to kind of get jump started on what did that mean to communicate? I thought it was a terrible role for me at first because I'm a terrible speller and I don't really have too many design. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I will say Grammarly. If you don't know Grammarly, that's oh. been a lifesaver for me. Me too. Anyways, too. yes. Um, and so all my close friends tell me like, Jay, you've gotten a lot better over the last couple of years with your, with catching errors. I'm like, well, Grammarly, you know, helps. Um, but essentially when I stepped into this role, I kind of got exposed to this whole communication, Marcom type of space. And one of the things that they had on the team at the time was this internet ministry, it was called at the time. And somebody, uh, our church is a very innovative church. They're always trying things, always doing things. And my boss at the time said, hey, we're not doing anything with this internet ministry. And this was about nine years ago, nine, 10 years ago. And they said, hey, why don't you just spend some time there? And because my church is a big church, we had a lot of just friends. And I, I, I think I early on talked to the guys at Life Church, and I just started to hear about what they were doing, saw what they were doing. And I, I really think the idea, the, the idea that people could watch from anywhere and I could engage them really was compelling. Um, I, some of you probably remember this, but about 10, 12 years ago, there was um, Louis uh, Gigolo did a, um, the 720 ministry, I think it was called. They, they would yeah. broadcast it. And th this, I remember I was in college and I would watch this on my computer, like live. And I just, I remember watching from Bellflower, California in my room. And I was like, I'm watching this experience. I think it was in Atlanta at the time. And I'm able to watch this real time. And, and again, this was early on on this. And I think when I got stepped into this role, I really connected the dots of how this broadcast from Atlanta all the way to California in, in my college years really was really filling for me. And I thought I could do this or I could be part of this for church every week. And that really energized me. And then we just started, I started to follow up and call people. We had response cards online at the time and I started to call people and I would have these conversations with people all around the world. And I think my brain just started firing and I, I really just saw the ability to kind of do church anywhere. Um, and and plus, I love the idea that there was a ton of questions around it. Like, is this church? What's possible? What's not possible? And even our church at the time was not, we, we weren't like, this all makes sense. It's just, it was very much, let's lean into this a bit and let's figure it out. So I think I just love the scale. Um, and then I, I've just grown over the years to be just really love technology and, and love what you can and can't do and figure out stuff like that. And so I, it just, it, the impact is, is amazing. And seeing it for churches of all sizes, I came to faith at a church under 500 where, um, you know, they've had to figure stuff out in the last couple of weeks of just Facebook live and making that better. And then a church of my size now, of you know, what does it look like to really do this on, on another level? And so it's, it's just, it, it's fun to do and it's been a journey and trust me, what we're doing now is not what we were doing 10 years ago. Um, and I love now everybody's an online pastor anyways. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Every pastor now is an online pastor. That is amazing. Um, Jeremiah Gooley um, says, hello, and can we take up an offering to help you put some pictures on your walls? So. <laughs> Jeremiah Gooley, yes. He is a friend of mine, and he is having fun with me. That's awesome. I know. I, am... we, I, moved, I, I moved into a new house. I haven't. The only thing I've had time to do is hang my TV. You can no, see where my priorities point. are. Exactly. As the online pastor, you got to have your TV up. But seriously, I'm loving seeing these questions come in. Keep them coming. Um, we'll definitely, I have a few questions I'm going to ask Jay on the front end, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. So. so Jay, talk to us a little bit about what does online church at Saddleback look like? Um, and what I want everybody on the call to hear, because we've got folks of all different churches, shapes and sizes and budgets and resources. So I want to hear what it looks like at Saddleback. And then I do have a question later on on how every church, no matter of your resource or size or scope, can get started today. But what does online church at Saddleback look like? Really, if you want to kind of take us from the beginning, what did it look like almost 10 years ago? And what does it look like now? And maybe it even looks different in COVID-19 than it did three weeks ago. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's definitely been phases because it's figuring out, okay, like, how do we do a service online? How do we do groups? You know, do we want to offer classes? And then now it's figuring out what does it look like for everybody to be online? And so I, I think early on, the main thing we first started to do, and this is before I was in, the, in my role, is we had people in Southern California, specifically in Orange County, that were traveling a lot. 
And so it was very much a, how do we get this resource online? So if people are traveling or somebody's sick, actually in the early days, it was behind a password and you had to be a member of our church. You literally had to become a member. Wow. And then you got a, you got a login. And this was like, this was 12 years ago. We, we were one of the first churches to stream live and kind of offer that. And then we started to, you know, ask questions like, well, maybe we should remove that login because it can be a, a resource for people who haven't attended the church yet, or maybe somebody shares it. And we like, and the idea is that they can experience this before they ever step foot. Um, and then about, it was about nine, 10 years ago, they started to explore with having an online pastor and just, just going, hey, what does it look, look like to have somebody in charge of this and just kind of stewarding it? And really, I think the idea was let's figure out where the, where the, you know, the, the gaps are and what's working, what's not. Something that we're really good at and our team, our, our worship team, our, our dev team, our technical team, everybody, our web team, they're amazing at pulling off a really premium experience online. We have high quality streaming, everything. Um, you know, it's just really nice. Um, and that, that was, I think one of the easiest things because production is something like, I think we're, we're really good at the, the larger question was, what does it look like for us to do our, our church paradigm? Every church has a different approach of how you disciple people. So, you know, we're called to, to reach people and to grow them up, to become like Jesus. And, and every church has a different method. And, you know, some do, you know, a week in service and then Bible studies, some do week in service classes, Bible studies, some do missions and, and it's like, okay, are we, are we turning on 100% of what we do online um, to what we do locally? And I think what we did is we just took one bite at a time. Um, and even now, I believe that there are some bites that we are still kind of figuring out. Um, and for most churches, and even for us, what was really simple is the local. And so we, we, kind, of, I, we kind of think about it this way, is that there's a nearby approach to church online, and then there's an anywhere approach. And the nearby approach is, Essentially, we'll engage anybody nearby really seamlessly. And the idea is that it's kind of like a front door where you experience us digitally first. And it might be through a class. It might be through watching. It might be through a special event. And the idea is you engage with us, but we eventually, kind of like a front door, we eventually invite you to come to our local community. And so a lot of churches, I think, have already done that with Facebook and Instagram and, and different things over the last couple of years. It's we figured out nearby. Um, the larger question is, is the anywhere strategy is what does it look like for somebody to watch from anywhere in the world and engage with your church and how much of that do you want to enable and, and what should you, what should it you? And even with the nearby approach, how much of your strategy do you want to put online? So for example, you know, we're not going to put these classes online. We're not going to like traditionally, for example, our church and a lot of churches won't put certain like kids ministry stuff online or junior high ministry because we want that to be experienced inside a building or we want to control that. Well, you kind of fast forward now to the last couple of weeks, everybody's had to rethink everything because now we don't have the luxury to gather and you have to put everything online. And I think a lot of churches where we're at now is we're trying to struggle of, okay, the rush now, we're two weeks into this, two to three weeks into this, at least in the, on the us side of things yeah um, a lot of the churches in china and hong kong and it, all these other places have already been they're, they're ahead here but for us it's okay we've rushed we put a bunch of stuff online now let's put our strategy hat back on and let's figure out what is, how does this all work together what should shouldn't we do what we should do you know for us it was get a worship service then we got groups online that was one of the first things we got we started to experiment with online groups about eight years ago and um, that that was a big learning like what works what not, what doesn't you know zoom zoom obviously has been the you know if you've looked at their stock over the last couple of weeks it's just oh my goodness skyrocketed skyrocketed um zoom has been an amazing tool that we've used for years and um now it's i i think it's it's a tool that a lot of churches are realizing wow you can actually connect with people and so i, re I really think for us it's we think about it nearby. So if you're near one of our physical locations, we want you to go there long term. But where we are very unique is if you're anywhere, meaning if you're somewhere far away, and we actually put a, 
a restriction on that. It's about a 30 mile radius. If you're 30 miles away from a physical campus, we want to do two things. I'll either help you get into a local church if I know of one in your area, or I'll help you start a small group in your home. And we'll actually start to move them toward doing physical community in their home. The interesting thing now is a lot of this is you're not supposed to gather over a certain size. So some of this stuff is put at pause. And now we've moved into our phase, at least our team is helping a lot of other teams think through this strategy. And now we're coaching a lot of teams and we're trying to figure out, and there's unique problems for every team. Some of this is really easy for some teams and some of it is, is hard. And so our journey has been very this slow kind of turn on and now it's helping everybody figure out online. Absolutely. Well, and what I love is that you've been doing this for, because how, how many how many years have you been at Saddleback? Eight? Nine? I've been, I've been at Saddleback 10, but I interned for a year. So yeah, so it's about, it's about 10 years. Yeah. That's amazing. So you created the beginning of this blueprint with the team there at Saddleback. I know it took a lot of brains together, but um, so many you know, brains. <laughs> yes. Yeah, lots of brains. Um, for about, you know, 10 years. And so you've had this framework that now you can share with so many churches and ministries, and we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of that. But one thing that I want every single person joining us today to hear from Jay, don't think of this time as COVID-19 as a temporary solution. I would love for you to hear Jay's story and the Saddleback team's story as inspiration of how you can take your community from online to offline after COVID-19. Um, we're going to dig into how he's discipling folks online and how they're planning even churches from their online engagement. But I don't want us to to leave this, however many, you know, if it's weeks or months that this lasts and say, oh, that was great. We did church online for a little bit. Now we're going to go back to the way that we've always done it. I would love for us to see how we can integrate online and offline together to um, build disciples. So Jay, the next thing I wanted to ask you was specifically about small groups. And I know that this is a passion of yours because you are, I know you so well and your heart, you really are a pastor. You love pastoring people. Um, sometimes I think that folks have an idea of an online pastor in their head as like the techie person. And yes, you are very tech savvy, but um, you love to pastor folks. I would love to hear how your small group and discipleship strategy, what does that look like um, at Saddleback from the online campus's point of view? Yeah, and I think what's really important is that essentially online amplifies what you're doing good and what you're doing bad. So essentially the internet removes, a, you know, this is a classic kind of, kind of philosophy around the internet that essentially it just, it removes all friction. So it makes everything easier, both the good and the bad. And the internet is neutral. So it will just do, it will just, you know, the idea is that if you're trying to protect the rights of people, you have to protect the rights of all people, regardless if you like their opinions or not. And the same thing with your strategy. So if you're really good at groups and you go online, your groups online are going to be really good. And then if, if your groups locally, for example, if your church is very dependent on a weekend sermon, like, okay, 90% of what we do is we gather people on Sunday and we, and we preach to them. And if, if you're not doing all the other stuff and now you're trying to turn on everything, it's, it's not because the platform didn't work. It's not because, uh, you know, the, the people don't get it. It's probably because your entire church paradigm, your methodology, however you disciple people is probably very dependent on just talking to people. And obviously when we look at scripture, specifically, if you just open up the first couple chapters of Acts, they're not just teaching, they're, they're doing things. It's both a hand and the feet moment um, where they're, they're having meals together. They're, they're serving the community. They're going out and telling people about who Jesus is. It's a very dynamic and, and fairly intimate type of community. And so for us early on, what became very easy for, for me at least when we were experimenting in our, in our, and I was having a lot of conversations with our leadership and figuring out what we should and shouldn't do was, well, if I just got my online watcher, somebody who's watching, so that, that was the dilemma is that I can't just go grab coffee with my people that are part of my community because it's, it's hard. But what I could do was if I knew I got them into a group, if I moved all my watchers into a group and they were in that group and my groups were healthy, I can, I can do two things. I can guarantee they were in community with other people, even if it was remote. I also can guarantee that it was healthy because I can monitor if my groups were healthy. And our, our church had a very strong paradigm around getting into groups. And so 
I don't have to do much to get people into groups because our church talks constantly about groups. And so really all I had to do was make the process of getting into groups seamless. And then I had to make sure that my groups were healthy. And so I really, for the first, I, I would tell a lot of people that I wasn't so much an online pastor as I was a small groups pastor with an online venue. So I was kind of treated like, you know, the men's and women's pastor would be treated. Um, the, you know, larger churches, they call this like affinity, where like you have a pastor for just the 20, 30s, you have a pastor for the women, men. And I just kind of joked, I was literally the online pastor for these groups. Um, and really, it's because if my groups were healthy, they were, they were, they were, we were, we were healthy. And so the paradigm around how we do groups is very, very straightforward. It was, I wanted our people to get together with their friends and I wanted them to meet regularly. So the idea is I would provide either video curriculum or discussion questions. And the idea is that they would jump either on a phone call or on a Zoom call or a Skype, whatever platform. And this is really important for us. We're pretty agnostic with where and how they meet is because I've learned, especially with having friends all around the world and travel is platforms are very, uh, you know, country specific. One country might use WhatsApp. Another country might use WeChat. We might use you know, iMessenger hey, with, you know, right now we're using, you know, I, I've been on a couple calls over the last couple of weeks and you're using, you know, uh, go, go to webinar. Other people use, you know, Zoom webinar. It, the platform is not as important as you just want them to meet with their friends. So if people normally with their friends, they have their platforms they want to meet. I will say Zoom is the, is more of a premium standard platform now over the last couple of years, they've kind of nailed the space. But it was just meet with meet with your friends and we're going to provide you with some discussion questions. And usually those discussion questions are either based off the weekend message or small group material that we've created or purchased. And so then we just wanted them to meet regularly. And then you get into the whole what does a normal group look like online? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that 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 is that is a little different. One of the biggest difference with online groups opposed to in person groups is you tend to not jump on an online group and want to share your screen and watch a video for 20 minutes. Yeah, like that's not a that's so that's like synchronized or, or asynchronized. And so, like, for example, our our groups, our online groups, most of our online groups, what they tend to do is they tend to watch a study together or read the study prior to meeting. And when they get on a video call or on a phone call, they focus on discussion that that's that's one of the biggest differences. I, and I've even experienced this with my physical group that I, I meet with. Um, we have so many kids that if we try to play a video for 20 minutes, a kid's going to be screaming or fighting in the other room. And so we've moved to that model too. And I think a lot of people are because a lot of churches and tools have become, have become digital where, you know, years ago, every, the host or the leader would get a DVD or the book and you couldn't decentralize that, but because everything's online, you can decentralize the training. So now everybody can watch it prior. And then the, the other big kind of principle here is, is how people meet is People tend to meet in two ways. You tend to have a home base, meaning this is where we talk continually. So they might have a Facebook group or a text thread or a Slack conversation. And then you have your live meeting room. And so the idea is those don't have to be the, the same space. So like, for example, me and my friends, we have a continual text message thread going on where it's just, this is how we talk to each other. Or my, my brothers, my, one of my brothers lives here. Another brother, uh, you know, uh, lives in Missouri. And the idea is we just text each other, but when we meet, we, get, we jump on a phone call or we jump on a Zoom call. And so I think online groups have those two platforms. They have a home base and they have a live meeting room. So you might have a Facebook group where you're talking 24 seven. And then when you meet, you jump on a Facebook video call. And so I think figuring out those two spaces are really important. I wouldn't, I, and I wouldn't pick a platform to say everybody has to meet on Zoom. Let people meet her, however they want, but have one platform that might be like your default. And then, and then just focus on discussion when you meet. Don't share your screen and people can do that, but I would focus on people watching it prior, jump on, focus on discussion. And then, and then lastly, understand those two things. Understand that people meet, have a home base, and then they have a live meeting room and they don't have to be the same. That is so good, Jay. I feel like that was gold right there. <laughs> what you just said for folks that might just feel overwhelmed of where do I even start? It's don't worry about micromanaging the platform. Just let and, and maybe, Jay, you could speak to this better than I could, but maybe it's finding those folks that are kind of your your ambassadors or that are more excited internally about the, or maybe they feel more comfortable with technology and kind of let them lead the way. 
um, and figuring out what tools they want to use for their online group. Um, but if somebody's out there and says, okay, Jay, I know, but I, my congregation is asking me and I need to give some recommended tools. What would you say is kind of the easiest, best entry level approach to the online groups uh, meeting and both those channels, the, the group, um, sorry, what did you say? It was like a live room chat room. Oh yeah. Live room and a home base. Yeah. Yeah. Li yes. Live room and a home base. Yeah. And I want to, I want to shout out Leo. He just texted me. He said, he's glad I made my bed. So um, yes, <laughs> your, your room so, is very nice. <laughs> hey, hey guys, we're all in this together. We're all trying to make shift rooms right now. And so it, sure. in our houses. Um, so yeah, I, so I, a couple things I, I would say, I think zoom.us is probably the standard. Now understand if you're using zoom, there's a 40 minute limitation. If oh, yeah. you are, if you don't have a paid account. And the other thing is, is that if your group met for 40 minutes and then you end, the host cannot do another meeting for another 30 minutes. And so you could use zoom and then you end. And then another member has to start a new group if you wanted to continue on. So that's just a tip uh, if, if you're going. The other thing is Facebook video calling has, is really helpful. Um, you know, FaceTime calling, a video calling is super helpful. And then uh, Skype and, and Google Hangouts are probably the most standard. We have a lot of groups are just calling each other on phones. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, doing, you, know, uh, you know, a group phone call. It's not, it's not a bad thing. I will say that the more, you know, th there are, there are standard, th there are, you know, um, levels of this that are better. Like a text, text message conversation is good, but a phone call is better because you can hear the inflection in each other's voices. Um, and you can understand what's going on. The other thing is a video call is better than a phone call because you can see people's uh, faces and you can know if they're paying attention or not. You know, you, you would know if I'm staring at something else and not you and you'd go like, hey, what's going on here? And so yeah. I think these are all, you're trying to mimic as much of a human interaction. You know, I, I remember testing out a couple of years ago, uh, Oculus Rooms on, on an Oculus Go device. And the cool thing about Oculus Rooms is that you can see people's head movements around. And I was talking to my friend and he was looking the other way. And I told him, I said, hey, hey, hey come over here. And this is where VR is going to make that even down the line. It's going to make that better. But try to encourage people right now just to meet like meet somehow, meet on a phone call or a video call. But I would coach your, your groups right now, which are all online groups, is try to move everything to video because video is, is the best experience. I will say you have to teach your members um, just how to do that because you have to think about lighting on your face. You mm -hmm. have to have a certain camera. You don't want the camera going up your nose. You know, all those things yes. that are really important. And if you've been on call, like, like, for example, when I was setting up this and for those who are watching the video right now, like I had to like make my bed. I really did. I had to make my bed. And then I had to, there's things in the background I like put on the ground because all that stuff is distracting. Mm -hmm. And you have to think about that. And not everybody has like, for example, having light on your face. If I was going to go open up my windows, my face would be totally white out because there'd be too much light. And right. these are the things that you will have to coach your your members on but early on don't worry about that you want them just to go you you literally just want them to go and figure it out and then what you can do is you can fine tune the process is people will help each other um one thing that i will say is just jump on youtube and search tutorials on you on like on using google hangouts zoom skype and literally link those out on your emails or text message or whatever you're doing to tell your members. There's so many tutorials. If you go on um, Small Group Network um, YouTube channel, they have a tutorial on how to use Zoom. And like, there's so many tutorials or fire up QuickTime on your Mac or whatever and record a quick tutorial um, on how to use something. I know that's what I ended up doing early on was I had one tutorial on how to use Zoom. So if somebody asked me how to meet, I shot a real quick tutorial. It was, I mean, this was like 2016. And I literally just to say, this is how you use Zoom. But now the funny thing is YouTube and even Zoom's website has all these tutorials. There's this cool feature that a lot of small group pastors are finding out about called breakout rooms. Yes, where, they're awesome. Which you, yeah, it's such a cool. So you can have like 25 people on a call. And if you're a host of the, of the actual Zoom call, you can hit this breakout room button 
and it will auto it you have two options you can automatically break people out into like groups of three to four um, or you can manually place people and you can do like subgrouping in a large meeting now yeah. i will say you have to enable it on the website you have to log into your zoom account on their actual website and it enable the feature under account management but it's a great feature um, but like you have to now learn how to do it well zoom has on their website they have tutorial videos of how to do it and if you just yeah. search there it's pretty seamless but um that, that's essentially what we do with groups is we, we try to we pick one premium platform and then i link out to a bunch of tutorials to all the other platforms and then we kind of just unleash people and i will find i, I will say generally is 75 percent of people figure out how to do it mm -hmm. the key is the 25 percent. then you help them you jump on a phone call or you connect them to somebody or you send them a, a link most people understand it, especially because a lot of people have online businesses now um, people understand or they have a friend that understands but you will spend some time with some of the people that are kind of lagging behind but the key is can you kind of can you empower the people that that can do it and then you can spend a little bit of time with the other people and then that saves you in the long run yeah okay we've got i'm gonna interrupt you because we've got some great comments folks actually have said um i love the interaction here guys keep it coming in the question box apparently zoom has actually lifted the 40 minute time for this period during co during COVID 19. so that's awesome yeah I, you know i will say on that that has not been uh nationwide so oh, i think okay. if, if you're so there are different regions, like for example, like three, four weeks a, weeks ago, they did that in Asia, a lot, a lot of the parts of Asia, and then they've done it. I think in Italy, in a couple of very specific regions, they've done it for some schools. Some schools yeah. can use Zoom for free, but it's not every user um, yet. Um, they're okay. slowly rolling it out. So I, I think I think everybody's petitioning them to do that for churches and ministries. But yes. I, I don't think I don't think it's it's universal just yet. Well, that's great. Well, Don said that um, his comment is that for a church, the monthly fee for Zoom is actually not that high and it allows continuing use instead of the time limit you spoke about. So that's good. Don feels like the, the monthly fee is actually worth the investment. Jay, um, how somebody asked, are you, is the church paying for the premium Zoom account for the small group hosts? We are not um, because we have like 9,000 groups, it just wouldn't be very feasible, um, even under like enterprise um, options. What what we do is we, um, we we essentially just encourage them to meet however they want, and we don't really get into that mechanism. I will say that if you had, if we had less groups and they were like, for example, th there's this language that's very familiar with a lot of groups pastors around centralized and decentralized and so what that means is centralized groups meet on your physical church property and so usually there's a lot less because churches can't hold a lot of groups just because of, of space and the idea is that you tend to do centralized groups because you want to start a bunch of new groups and so we hypothetically would pay for our centralized groups where if um if somebody wanted to start a large online group like right now one of the things we're doing and this is something a church might consider is as you're educating people how to do online groups, what you might do is you might pick a night of the week and say, hey, on Tuesday night, if you're not in a group, join our online group. And you might have a very large group, like you might have 50 to 75 people join it. And the idea is you do that for six weeks mm -hmm. and you meet all together and you use the breakout room function. And the idea is that you, you kind of model what an online group is. And for six weeks, you, the, the pastor or a key volunteer leads that large group. And then on the sixth week after the study is done, you say, hey guys, you've all done an online group for the last six weeks. See, that wasn't that hard. And on the seventh week, you encourage them to meet individually in, in, the, in their smaller groups. And so you kind of model what you ultimately want them to do. And so I might, and we, we actually, we're actually doing this right now. We launched uh, centralized online groups every night of the week. And wow. I have a couple key volunteers that are leading those, and I'm going to pay for those accounts because yeah. they're they're centralized. But what what we wouldn't do is that once those groups, let's say they start, we start five groups out of that large group, I'm not going to pay for each of those accounts. Um, those would be individuals that are kind of going out because we would encourage them to meet however they want to meet. And and the other thing is it does get expensive. I will say one tip: you hypothetically could, and I know some churches have done this, you could buy a couple paid accounts you could there's something called a um it's like a permanent link 
you can you can check this box to make it permanent link and you can allow people to enter the room when the host is not on and what you ah. could do is you could schedule the link out or the room out like a conference room like a virtual conference room so for example your church could buy three paid accounts or two paid accounts and just rent out the space a little bit not rent it you know don't charge them but but right I, I, yeah yeah that would be bad schedule it um, <laughs> i just i just gave somebody a really Somebody's gonna scam a lot of people right now off that idea. <laughs> yeah, um, <don't> do that. <laughs> but but schedule it out like like a conference room. The only issue with that is that the problem is is that people could jump in and out like a normal like right now somebody could just open this door like my or my right. kids might they could just open the door. Someone could just enter that room and if if a group's going on and they're being transparent, it might be it might be uh, it might be a little risky. But if you keep it in your community, you could just buy a couple and literally on a Google spreadsheet, schedule out the room. That might be one idea to explore. That's a great idea. A couple other comments, because I know we've only got 20 minutes left and we've got so many questions coming in. Um, uh, Troy said, so far in recent weeks, our senior citizens groups are using Zoom and meeting online more than any other group. I love that. Yes, so great. That, um, let's they, I, I, will say, I will say people, you know, underestimate people over a certain age. Um, mm -hmm. People get technology. Technology is not an age thing. You know, the joke is, I think, I forget who said this, but they were, they, somebody wiser than me was talking about like, people like say the baby boomers don't, are not, don't understand technology and they always make the joke, they invented the internet. Like, yeah. <laughs> like I love that, I love that. And it's so it's true, so like I, I have people in my community that are in their 80s and 90s and I have people that are, you know, in their 20s because tech, you know, no matter what age I am, I'm always gonna embrace technology, that's just, I'm more of a digital native and it doesn't matter. And I will say most people will figure out. And if you teach them how to do it, and that that's the that's the big thing. And I think that's why, you know, uh, one, one, of, one of the keys here is your church has to figure out how to do large gatherings online, like Facebook Live, YouTube Live, the church online platform. You have to figure out how to encourage people to meet in groups like use Zoom and Skype and Google Hangouts. And you have to encourage people to meet one on one um, with Zoom or a phone call or something like that. And if you teach each each of your staff, your um, your your key volunteers, your members to do the lar the large, the small, um, and the one on one, then people can actually do the thing that we call church because that's what you have to do. And the hard part is this is ending over things where if you're the pastor, you need to not do everything, you need to empower people. You know the thing we talk a lot about is you know like you know church is not you know church for a lot of churches church is like like a football game where you have you might have 30,000 people in the field and you have 40 on on I mean 40 people on the field 30,000 in the stands where churches actually should be the opposite there should be 40 people in the stands and 40,000 down on the field and technology is this amazing thing where you can decentralize and you can hand off because it's like just do it on zoom and so the encouragement is think through each of those and and empower people to do it and trust me people of all ages will start doing it that's awesome. Um, well, I wanted to hear how you at Saddleback um, and the team have actually planted campuses and churches out of the online um, church, but I want to dig a little bit more because we're getting a ton of questions on specifically the online part of things. So I want to make sure that we can answer some of those. We talked a lot about technology, but what we haven't talked about is streaming services. Um, and I know a church like Saddleback who has, you know, probably well before COVID, I think you were getting what, 25,000 attendees online every week. Now it's, yeah. what is it now yeah. with COVID? It's, 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 a yeah, it's double, triple that. Um, the hard part is, is, and I, I think this is some, probably somebody has a question on this is we're streaming to all these platforms and it's trying to wrangle in the numbers. It's trying yeah, to figure out how to measure, um, different numbers. So like, and, and I, I want an encouragement out there to somebody who's watching this, don't feel overwhelmed with the numbers and how to track it. We're all in that together. And, and trust me, if somebody reports one number and if, if, if you get a little like, wait, why are their number bigger? People are reporting different things. They're on Facebook. You have a, a number called reach, which is how many people see it in a feed on. And then you have a number like engagement was how many people click on it. And then you can get into retention. And for us, our church, we focus in on retention. How many people watch 30 minutes? Um, and you can get that on YouTube and Facebook. It takes some work, but you're actually able to do that. So, yeah. but I, I think. I think it, yeah, it's a bit, it's a big thing and it's streaming. So I'm, I'm curious, what are the, is there a specific question on like, like yeah, what platforms so, are we using? Yeah. So folks are asking, basically, this has been awesome to talk about small groups, but what about for churches who are just even trying to get their service online? So 
Can you walk us through what are some of the different streaming platforms that you would recommend that churches who are just starting out or maybe that have been doing it for a while but want to improve can start utilizing? Yeah, I, so I, I think that there's a couple different, you know, upgrades on this. And I, I think at a bare minimum, your church, if, if you're a church under 100 and you're just kind of rolling and you're just, you know, trying to do this. And, and even our, our church, we have multiple campuses, you know, all around the world and each campus is at a different size. And so, yes, so even within our own like ecosystem, we are learning, you know, what is easy and what's not. So for example, if you meet in a school, you can't just go set up cameras and have streaming equipment there because you might not have good enough Wi-Fi or a dedicated line. Um, but if you have a building, some of our campuses do have buildings. And so that's a little bit more seamless. Or even for us, we're, we've learned this over the last couple of weeks, what's simple and not. Um, so for, for most churches under, let's say, you know, I would say under 150, I, you know, I would really lean in towards Facebook Live. Facebook Live to your Facebook page, not to your private account. Um, actually set up on your page. Uh, I would just do it from your phone. A uh, couple things. I would make sure your nobody can call you during that time. And I would also get, uh, make sure, get a tripod or something or get somebody else to hold it. Um, trust me, leaning your phone up against a box is pretty helpful, you know, and, and test it a, a really, like, this is a really simple tip. You can't do it to a page, but if you go live on your individual account, on your own Facebook account, you can actually set the stream to private under the settings and you can test it. And so I would say if you've never Facebook live before, or you're just figuring out, go do a setup that you would do on Sunday morning and set it up and on the setting on who can see it, it's default to public go down to only me, only me is an option. And this way you can go live and you can test it afterwards before anybody sees it. But that, that would be my encouragement. And just That's be aware good. of like your, your lighting, your audio, uh, you know, uh, make sure, you know, kids have iPads so they're being parented in the other room, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> Well, what about um, Jay, a couple of people, and we got some emails about this too this week, that some folks have had their live streaming, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, that's crashed. Um, so some churches are going to pre-recording. What are you seeing yes. um, and what would you recommend live streaming versus pre-recording? Yeah, so pre-recording is, is a great option. And actually, Facebook does this really easily. There's two features that are, are really simple. Is One is Facebook Premiere where what you can do is you can actually upload a video and it will treat it like a live event, very similar. And so what's confusing, and, I, I, and, I, and I'm with you, there's Facebook Live, there's Facebook Premiere, and then there are Facebook Watch Parties. And so- So confusing. You know, I know. So Facebook Live is, is literally, it, it's a live event and it's the best experience, I will say, interaction wise. Um, there's ways you can actually trick Facebook Live thinking you're pre-recorded. Uh, you can actually trick it and use a pre-recorded video, but this requires software. So this is where you need like an OBS or a Wirecast software, where what you do is you actually have software on your computer, uh, preferably on like a desktop computer that is a, is a power computer. And what you do is you, you actually set up outputs on this computer and you send it to Facebook Live. And so you actually could play any video pre-recorded and Facebook thinks it's live. And I will say, Facebook Live, either from your phone, just doing like a selfie or using the Wirecast OBS type of software is, is the best because both the algorithm treats it better, a Facebook mm -hmm. Live, and then also it has a better engagement. Um, Facebook Premiere, what it allows you to do is you would upload the video prior to your start of your event, like a couple hours before. Um, and I will say Facebook has been struggling with encoding videos, like processing it. So more time is better. Don't upload an hour video 30 minutes before. You're not going to get it in time. So upload it the night before. And what you do is when you schedule it, you schedule it to go live, let's say at 9 a.m. and you check a Facebook premiere button. And so what happens at nine o'clock, let's say on Sunday morning, your pre-recorded video will go live and it says premiere. And so it's different. It's not Facebook live and it's not, the chat is a little different than live. It's more like comments, but you, it is live and people can't scrub forward um, and like skip yeah people can follow along and so it's a really nice feature for churches who have bandwidth issues or can't afford you know different software to pull that off now watch parties are another thing you can do a video that's already been uploaded or streamed and so for example our church what we did is we went live saturday night at four and then 
on Sunday morning, we didn't upload another video and we didn't go live again. What we did was on our main Facebook page, I selected a video and you literally go, you go to your page and you click the dot sometimes. So the watch party and a lot of these features are hidden. You click the mm -hmm. three dots, and it, which is the more dot and it says start a watch party. And what you do is you select a video from your, either from your page or from another thing. And it allows you to host a, like a private chat. The thing with watch parties is people can actually, it follows along, but people can choose to skip forward. Mm, and so yes. watch parties are really nice, but people can choose to kind of, you know, cheat a little bit. And so yeah. this is why Facebook Live is really nice. And then if you can't do that because of technology limitations, I would do Facebook Premiere. Worst case, you can always do watch parties, but watch parties, the video needs to already be up. You can't upload it right there. And then um, people can skip forward. So I think I think a lot of churches, um, I think they need to use the Facebook premiere. They need to just upload it and try it out. And YouTube has Facebook premiere as well. You can upload it and it's called, it's called, do you want this to make this premiere? And actually YouTube's premiere feature is pretty nice. It's a little better than you, Facebook's because you can have it. What happens is it goes live at nine and then there's a live chat. The key is you have to be there when it goes live and, and you should have yourself or somebody else have it like a, a digital greeter there. Somebody who's kind of there hosting and engaging at those specific times. And you can, you can do it multiple times. So you can actually align with your service times if you really wanted to. Yeah, that's great advice, Jay. But if you're just starting out, just start with Facebook Live, where you're at your house or you're, um, for those of you that aren't in a statewide shutdown yet, where you're actually at the church, maybe on stage and have somebody there that's holding it six feet away. Six feet away. Six, um, yeah, six feet away. Yeah. <laughs> streaming it. So lots of options there, depending on where you are. Jay, um, would really love for you is, and I know this is something we could do a whole nother webinar on. So if you can just take, you know, two minutes to talk about as churches are seeing the power of online church, once we can start meeting back, you know, in our physical locations, um, can you share a little bit about how Saddleback has gone from online to offline by growing attendance at Saddleback, but then also planting campuses and churches out of the online community. Yeah, I think this is actually one of the things that our leadership and just our church has been the most interested in. Prior to me ever being in my role, it was like, how do we make it more affordable for people to just plant a church? And I think every, every there's networks and large minds always thinking about this. I think the barrier of entry to planting a church tends to be unfortunately high risk and really expensive. And it's, how do we make that simpler? And for us, it's, hey, we have people watching from everywhere. And with a church our size, that audience is, is mixed. It's people part of our community, it's pastors and people part of other churches. And then there's are people that I'm really, I, I feel called to is the people that are unchurched, that don't have something near them. They don't have a healthy church experience down the street. And a lot of people, I think, uh, specifically in the U.S., oversimplify that there's a church just down the street for everybody. Um, that's mm -hmm. that's not true. Yes, I understand. Um, you know, you might have that because you're in a large city, but a lot of people live in rural areas. A lot of people live in areas where there might be a church, but it doesn't mean it's a healthy church. Um, th there's all sorts of things you have to figure out. And so for us, we've really zeroed in on two things. How do we connect people through our both our website and like our large Facebook group to each other nearby. So I'm in, I'm in St. Petersburg, this area, or, or I'm in, you know, this part of Montana. How do we make it where people can seamlessly connect? And then how do we, how do we provide programming and resources so that they can actually uh, go from not just connecting digitally, but connecting offline. So one of the things we started to experiment with years ago was uh, meetups is, mm -hmm. Hey, you want to meet people in your area? How do, just meet up with people. And so host a meetup and we call them, you know, meetup.com was a, is, is a popular platform, but it was more popular a couple of years ago. And it was just like, Hey, and like, we would say, you want to host a meetup, let's say in San Francisco, we would say, great, pick a date and a time. And what I would do and our team would do is we would send an email to everybody in our database that was in that area. Um, what's really important. One of the unintended consequences of a lot of these privacy things that have popped over the last couple of years is that I can't really seamlessly connect people and provide private information to individuals um, because of privacy rules. But what I can do is I can make them aware of an event in their area 
or I can make them aware of the contact information. So people will say, how many people are watching in this part of Georgia? Well, what they want is they want all the email addresses of those people. Well, I can't share that because of privacy, but what I, what I encourage them to do is they go, hey, what you could do is you can host an event there and I can send an email to all those people in this area. And then they can choose to elect to kind of go into that. And so for us, meetups were a big part of fleshing out those people of nearby areas. And then what we started to experiment with a couple of years ago was this idea of, of gatherings, home gatherings, is we want you to watch with other people. And so we provided this program kind of and training and method around, hey, just start watching with other people. And, and the idea is we'll actually provide some coaching and some kind of some systems around what does it look like for you and your friends to actually watch the service in community with other people. You know, some of those, you know, right now those gatherings are actually on pause, like, like a lot of things, because we want to keep them under a certain number. Yeah. But I will say, this is one of the biggest things that we are still trying to figure out because it, it is a big ask to say, hey, you're hundreds or thousands of miles away from our physical church. And the idea of them doing church with us physically is a big thing. It's a, it's a confusion. But I we are very motivated to crack that. Um, and um, our church is, is, is pouring more resources into that, you know, more smarter people than me to kind of take it to the next level. But I, I do think my, my suspicion is people coming out of school, um, these seminaries, I, I think a lot of this technology, we're going to have a just a rush of people planting online first and figuring out, can they can they actually build like gather a crowd? Because one of the number one things that churches struggle with is location and just having the gift of gathering people and online, you'll find out really quick. If you upload your videos to YouTube and you start teaching on Facebook, you'll find out are people interested or not. YouTube is brutally honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, with, like I, that's one of the worst thing you upload a video and you're like, Oh my, only 10 people viewed that. Okay. Maybe, you know, maybe yeah. I'm not called to this, Yeah, um, right. but I, I think, I think, I think we're going to have over the next couple of years, especially now where churches are being forced to do it. I think in the next three years, we're going to have this boom of people just planting churches online and figuring out, and it's going to do two things. We're going to have more churches launch. And we're also going to have more failures up front. Um, but I think the risk will be less and less yeah. people will be burned. And I'm kind of excited for that boom. That's awesome. Well, Jay, I know that you write on this topic so much. You have amazing content. So where can people find that content? There are so many questions. We don't even have time to dig into all of them. But I know that you answer a lot of these questions on your website. So where can folks go to find out more about best practices and how to start experimenting with online church? Yeah, so there, there's a bunch of stuff on, on my website, jcranda.com. Um, there's also the corona, coronavirus and the church.com. And I know you guys put up a great resource of linking out a bunch of stuff. There's so many great stuff. You know, the funny thing, I, I think I was texting you about this, Holly, that I have a lot of resources around. If, if you care, right now we're not really in that moment, but I've historically created a lot of stuff around the, the philosophy and the theology around what we should and shouldn't do and what we should think about. Which the is great, is Jay, now, because, well, I want to interrupt you because some people had that yeah. question of how do you, even even now, theologically, what is the argument for online church, which I don't want to address here because that's a whole nother webinar, but you talk about yeah. that on your website. And I've just put the um, URL, jcranda.com, in the chat feature. And I'm also going to put our uh, Vanderblumen uh, Perfect. COVID 19 link. But go ahead, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, no. And and I think we, it's, I, I think you do because when this, when we get pulled, back when church starts having, you know, meeting in person again, we're going to have to have some conversations of like what, what, what that was. And then what are we going to continue? And, and my hope is your church doesn't just go back to normal, normal ways that you lean into this technology moment and realize that this can be a powerful way. There's a lot of people that said, no, no, no. And even like, you know, you know, stronger language around that. And mm -hmm. essentially now are realizing, oh, wow, this is, this is possible. And I, I think the one thing I, I want to encourage people on is there, this is kind of like, you know, the, there's this a classic, I think, philosophical argument about the, the totem pole is that, you know, a classic totem pole is at the bottom of the totem pole um, is like, it's, you know, you're, you're kind of, this is the ant. And at the top of the totem pole is, is God. And, and, and ultimately humans were created in God's likeness. And so we're somewhere near the top. We're, we're very like God because we're literally created in his image. At the bottom is an ant. And this is why, like, why, why is it different? 
where if I step on an ant, if I deliberately go kill an ant um, right now, it's different for me than deliberately killing a dog. And the reason is because a dog is more like God than an ant is. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's this, you know, this, there's this scale of more like, and I think when you're thinking about community and church, there are things that are at the bottom and at the top. So like, for example, this is why like video conferencing is at the top. It's more like community. Uh, you know, text is at the bottom. And I think your church is figuring out what do we want to do and what is possible. And so, for example, high care type of things. If, if you're going to do counseling online, maybe you're not going to do phone calls. They have to do video calls and they have to have headphones in and there has to be nobody in the room. You have to create these rules. But what happens is if you're thinking of it, well, it's all online and nothing can happen in person, then then you start to go, it's, it's all or nothing argument. I don't think the conversation around all online church is all or nothing. It's, it's, it's a scale and it's figuring out what is possible and where it should be and providing different rules. Um, and, and I'm really excited for churches to kind of unlock this, but I'm really, I'm, I'm nervous that some will kind of recoil when things go back. And yep. my encouragement is some things do need to be recoiled. Like I totally understand that, but some things should continue on and continue to lean in and think about what is possible and dream and what you'll find out like our church has over the last 10 years is wow this some of this is possible and we do have lines in the sand we're not going to do this we will do this um yeah. but don't don't fully rebound right now we, when awesome. stuff goes back to normal. continue on I love that. So additional resources, check out the chat feature. The two, I don't want to overwhelm you guys because there's so much out there. So go to jcranda.com, start to dig into his resources. I know, Jay, you even have like an online course, I think, that's on your website about online church. And then also check out churchcovid19.com, which our team is using as our centralized hub of COVID-19 resources, where we will post the replay link to this video. Um, also, check out the screen. Our team is here to support you during COVID-19. We have lots of clients that are facing unprecedented things that they've never even had to face before, like reorganizing staff, having to look at layoffs, thinking about online giving for the first time, um, or having issues with staff of, okay, yeah, we need to do online streaming, but we don't even have anybody internally to do that. So we are here to help. Our team is standing by. We'd love to offer you just a free 30-minute phone call with anything that we can do to serve you. So email me, holly at vanderblumen.com, or you can call us, but I'll get you connected to somebody on our team. And if we don't know the answer, we will find it for you because our heart is just here to serve you in any way that we can. So that's holly at vanderblumen.com. And I've gotten so many questions about the replay link. So we will be working on that and um, be able to publish it on our site and send it out to you guys. But make sure you join us this Thursday. So in 48 hours, I'm going to be doing this all over again with Jim Shepard, who is um, principal at Generis. And we're specifically going to be talking about giving in a time of crisis and stewardship. So Jim has over 30 years of experience helping ministries with the capital campaigns and giving and stewardship strategies. And so he's going to be able to provide immense wisdom. So if there's somebody on your church staff that you know needs to hear that, please have them register and join us. Same time, same place. You'll get to be here in my home again <laughs> on Thursday. Jay, thank you so much for your time. The Lord has just given you so much wisdom on this. I'd love to pray for you before we end our webinar together. Lord, we just thank you so much for Jay and just his heart of um, his, his shepherding and pastoral heart, Lord, and his gift of, of technology that you have given him. And Lord, just how he has used the creative gifts to, to advance the kingdom, Lord. It is just phenomenal to stand back and cheer him on from the sidelines as he experiments with using technology to reach people for the gospel all over the world. And so, Lord, we just pray blessings upon him and his family and the team at Saddleback as they're an amazing resource resource to churches and ministries that are figuring this out for the first time. And Lord, we just pray for every church and ministry that's represented on this webinar today. There's hundreds of people on this call. And so, Lord, we just pray for reduced anxiety. We pray for your peace during this time. We pray that we would just draw near to you and seek your wisdom and counsel as we seek to be there for everybody in our congregation and on our staffs, our volunteer teams, and in our broader community. And Lord, we thank you for all of your many blessings, even in a time of crisis. In your name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you everybody for joining us and we'll be back here on Thursday.